So I think that's the first critical component to Occupy. And I think one of the things that we should think about in terms of continuing the Occupy movement is to how to continue that momentum around the notion of equality, that our society is fundamentally unjust, not simply because we don't protect individual liberty. Uh, and of course, Zuccotti Park was renamed Liberty Park, so they, they don't, they're, they're not opposed to liberty, clearly. The Occupy movement uh, it is forceful on the issue of liberty, but I think the central thrust of the movement was equality. And uh, as I said, this reflects, in a way, a central tension in both American constitutional law and American, constitution, and American life that has existed since uh, 1776 and more importantly since 1787 where the notion of equality was written out of the Constitution. Um, second, a, a key aspect obviously of the, of the Occupy movement is the notion of occupation. And I wanted to discuss the notion of occupation both as a political notion and as a First Amendment notion. Um, I get a lot of comments from the press and from students uh, to say, saying, well, the, the occupation was okay for a few days, but why did they have to have it go on so long? You know, why is it? Uh, I think one of the brilliant tactics of the Occupy Wall Street position, which has been replicated, was to come up with this concept of occupation that what it was not going to do was to be a one-shot demonstration, um, which would have some big impact. It could be 100,000 people, or it could be a few hundred people, but it was going to be go it was going to go away the next day. Um, the notion of a of a ongoing, indefinite occupation um, hit at the point that to get something in the public mind, it can't be a temporary one-shot thing. Um, I'm, I'm sure there have been many far bigger, more militant uh, demonstrations over the past couple of years which have gotten very little attention. What got the Occupy attention, I think, was the fact that it was there day after day, it wasn't going away, it was a continual 24 hour a day presence. And so the notion of the occupation was that we are going to, to inject ourselves into the public debate by not being temporary, by not being a one-shot deal. Now, the term to occupy, if you go to look at Webster's Dictionary, I was actually astounded by what I found in Webster's Dictionary. Because it, the first definition is not what I would have thought, which is the physical occupation of something. I would have thought to occupy means to take over or to, um, to seize in some way. The definition that I found in Webster's was to engage, to engage the intentions of, to engage the enemy and uh, the energies of. And that's what Occupy has been successful in doing. It's been successful in engaging the attention of the American people. And I think it was because of this occupation, because of this ongoing, uh, not a temporary thing. Now, that concept um, itself leads into, I think, a profound debate in First Amendment law. You know, <coughs> there are two ways, and I think, of, of viewing the First Amendment, and I think they're in some tension. The first and more traditional way is that the First Amendment as with the Bill of Rights in general, presents a, pr um, provides a shield around all of us. So when you walk down the street, you have a shield around you, and it could be, it's invisible, but it could be seen as the First Amendment. And so if some policeman comes and tries to beat you up for your views, or if the government tries to put you in jail for your views, or they try to censor you, um, you have the the First Amendment protecting it. Uh, it says that God, Congress shall pass no law abridging your freedom of speech. It has a negative implication from that perspective, namely 
It prevents the government from doing anything to interfere with your rights. Uh, it provides for autonomy, namely you can believe what you want, you can say what you want, and the government can't put you in jail or censor you on that. Uh, and that has been historically one traditional <coughs> view of the First Amendment, that it is akin to, or it is one of the key elements of individual autonomy, of individual liberty. Uh, and one of the first aspects of the Bill of Rights that was incorporated against the states was the First Amendment that was seen as a fundamental aspect of liberty. There is a second way of viewing the First Amendment, however, which has undertones of equality. And that comes from uh, a Supreme Court opinion by Justice Brennan, uh, in, in which he says, the First Amendment is designed to protect the marketplace of ideas and to provide for a robust marketplace of ideas. Now, from that perspective, you're not interested <coughs> as much in individual autonomy. What you're interested in is robust public debate. Now, these two notions are in considerable tension. And you can see them, the tension, both through the Citizens United opinion of the Supreme Court and through the Occupy movement. Um, because while one might think that providing as much individual autonomy as possible would give rise to robust debate, in fact, that's not often the case. In fact, by allowing some people who have money to have tremendous impact on the public debate, you are in fact drowning out others. And the Citizens United is the best example of this. Once you say that corporations have a First Amendment right to give as much money to electoral campaigns as they want, and they can't be prevented from doing that, it drowns everybody else out. Their individual right leads to a deadening of the public debate and not a robust public debate. Now what I think the Occupy movement tried to do is to re-inject or reinvigorate the public debate with opinions and views that had not been uh, generally um, debated, uh, viewed by the elite as important. Um, and in doing so, and, and as I said, that's part of this whole occupied position. Um, in doing so, I think what they were uh, what they were really saying is that the public debate is skewed. Public debate is um, stifled. And by um, occupying these public squares, we are trying to prevent the status quo, both in terms of debate and in terms of the way the society is running from continuing. Now, we, now, with that, second point, you look to what the Constitution says. Um, one of the elements of the Constitution which sort of protects this robust marketplace of ideas, robust public debate, is the public forum doctrine, which says um, that the government has to make available streets, parks, uh, traditional public forums to people to utilize. Um, that wasn't often the case. It wasn't always the case. You know, in the, 18, uh, the eight, late 1890s, early 1900s, uh, uh, Chief Justice Holmes uh, of the Massachusetts Supreme Court later to become a famous Supreme Court justice, analogized a public park to a person's house and said, the government can kick you out of public parks just as a person can kick you out of their front lawn. And that was the law for many years until the 1930s, when under pressure from the CIA, the unions and from uh, political organizations, the court accepted that um, streets and parks were public forums and had to be made available to everyone. Now what the Occupy movement um, raises then is, well, to what extent do these streets and parks have to be made available to um, and the government says, and it has the Supreme Court precedent uh, squarely in its favor, which says, well, you can, you can impose reasonable regulations.
time, place, and manner regulations. And the time, place, and manner regulations here are that you can have a demonstration, you could pick it, but you can't have 24-hour occupation because that's uh, the government says that's, unre that's not reasonable. And the first question is, what's the compelling government interest in preventing the 24-hour? There has to be some significant government interest in doing that. And what, what is the interest, assuming that there's no crime associated with it, there's no noise associated with it, assuming that bad things are not happening with these occupations? <coughs> and um, in my view, while every case has lost but one, uh, there was one, one of these Occupy cases won, and that's because the, the um, state of the city of uh, Columbia, South Carolina, had no regulations at all. And in the absence of regulations, the court said, you have to let them stay. So, as you might gather, a week later, <laughs> Columbia enacted emergency regulations, <laughs> and the court said, you can kick them out. Um, but it raises the question of if you could, if you're allowed to, on your jacket, say, fuck the war, and that's protected, um, even though it's controversial, even though it may be seen by some as obscene, um, what is the significant government interest in preventing a camping on or occupation of public squares? And if you look at the First Amendment as protecting the marketplace of ideas, isn't that type of activity necessary to engage the public? The theory that the court articulated on the on flag burning, or protects flag burning, or the fuck the war t-shirt, is that sometimes to get the public attention, you have to do things which are very controversial, which people won't like. Well, I think that at this moment in history, to get the public attention, you have to do something that's not going away. And I think under this sort of marketplace of ideas notion, uh, which is part of the public forum doctrine, uh, the courts have reached the wrong opinion, the wrong, wrong view. Now, of course, they often reach the wrong view. They reach the wrong view in Citizens United. But I guess the broad point I'm trying to make is that there are these two different competing visions of the First Amendment. One is protecting robust debate, and the second one is protecting individual autonomy. And they're somewhat in conflict. <coughs> and the Occupy movement ought to be protected constitutionally because it has significantly aided public debate in this country. The third point I want to make, which is tied to the first two, is I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in Pittsburgh. And because um, we had a unique situation, which, um, which led to a, a unique court battle. In Pittsburgh, the Occupy movement decided to <coughs> occupy a public square owned by Mellon Bank, one of the major banks in the country and in Pittsburgh. Uh, and it's a public square smack in downtown. It's private property owned by Mellon Bank. Mellon Bank, um, like many of the cities uh, in the initial stages of the Occupy movement, didn't want to cause trouble and they let them stay there. Uh, they let them stay there until December 9th. They were there for almost two months. On December 9th, they said, it's private property, you're trespassing, get out. We want to close the whole park for the winter. It's a public square, not, not huge, but you know, half a city block. Um, the problem they had is that Pittsburgh still is somewhat of a union town, even though unions are on the decline. And the unions were supporting the Occupy very strongly. And the police department that was, said, we're not going to arrest them. We're not going to evict them. You can have a notice of eviction, but we're actually not going to evict them. The police department and the sheriff department made this position clear. They said there's been no arrest for two months, no, uh, no violence, no drugs, 
In fact, we go to the Occupy people and they help us uh, catch criminals. It happened a couple of times. You know, they said, do you know this person? They said, oh, it, it was a, an unbelievably nonviolent civic occupation, but a militant, nonetheless. And there were about 50 tents, uh, 50 people actually sleep camping out, including a number of homes. So the police department said, we're not going to shut it down. You have to go to court. So Melvin Bank went to court. But they sought an injunction. Now it wasn't the Occupy people seeking an injunction, which is the case in almost all these other cases, but Melvin Bank seeking an injunction. And there were two major issues. The first one um, is not as interesting, but it was that to get an injunction, under the law, you need what's known as irreparable harm. You have to show something terrible is going to happen if I don't get this injunction. And there was nothing terrible happening. There was no injuries, no arrests, no drugs, no violence, no noise. What could they say was terrible? The grass was muddy, was, mm -hmm. was screwed up. But that's not irreparable harm. So they said the irreparable harm is that they're trespassing, and trespassing is per se irreparable harm. The trouble is, is that in Pennsylvania there was a Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme Court case that said it wasn't. Um, so they had that problem. The second, more interesting and more fundamental problem was that this square was picked because it's a public square. It is used by the public. It, for, until, until a week ago, it looked like any ordinary city sidewalk any ordinary city park. There were no, no trespassing signs there. There was nothing to make the ordinary person think that this was private property, which they shouldn't go on. And in fact, people, there are sidewalks in the park which people use to get from the subway to the buildings, etc. That's number one. So it acted, looked, and felt like a public park and a public site. Second, when Mellon Park did, did, built this, they applied for public subsidies. And they got public subsidies. And they articulated that this was going to be a public plaza park. That was what they're, and now they're saying, well, no, it's not going to close it. Um, and third, uh, in Pittsburgh, when you make a, new, a big new development, which no, no one back did, you have to put aside a certain amount of space for public space called urban open space. And we believe that this was urban open space. And Mellon called part of their case, they called the city zoning administrator, who agreed, turned out agreed with us that it was urban open space. And urban open space has to be kept open to the public. It can't be closed. And so we said, this is, um, this is a public forum. You may own it, but it has to be kept open to the public, and the issue that we felt this all raised was whether downtown Pittsburgh, where there are a number of these urban open spaces, um, whether the big corporations could close the public space to the public, and that's what Mellon was trying to do. And so the Occupy legal case in Pittsburgh became a case about keeping public spaces open for public dialogue, public discourse, and public forum. Um, and we had a two-day trial. The whole thing kept Mellon from evicting these people for two, two months, because the trial was dragged on, and you know, the briefs dragged on. And, and finally, what the court said was, it's irreparable harm because property interests govern, and any, any interference with property is uh, is irreparable harm. And second, um, and ignored the Pennsylvania Supreme Court case, and second, that this, no one had closed this for the winter, so it's only a public forum in the non-winter months. And the, during the winter, it could be closed. Um, what's going to happen after the winter, because the occupied people are thinking, uh, and, and, and the sheriff and the police still didn't want to evict. So Mellon had to go back, even after the decision to get a specific court order, ordering the sheriff to evict them. Um, and then the occupied folks said, we don't want to get the sheriff. The sheriff might get into contempt here. And we don't want to put the sheriff in jail. 
So we'll they had a march in which they vacated the park. And now Mellon has all sorts of signs saying this is private property, you can't go on here. Yeah, you can. Um, this raised two questions to me, and I'll end with this. Um, the first is why a judge who was not a conservative reactionary judge, who was a moderate judge, why she went this route. And what I think happened, um, the judge actually is a friend of mine. <laughs> I haven't talked to her since this case, <laughs> and uh, I doubt I, I'll ever talk to her about this case. But um, she was also a friend of the attorney for Mellon Banks. Um, maybe a better friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, what I think happened was the feeling in, in downtown Pittsburgh among the elite that the Occupy movement had served its purpose. It, it raised the issues that it wanted to raise. And that was time, enough was enough. This was going too far. You know, a week, two weeks, a month, symbolic occupation. And in fact, that's how her opinion started. That the Occupy, she was very sympathetic to the Occupy movement. It, 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 it uh, served its purpose. And when I got newspaper calls from the newspaper reporters, that was the first question second question, the third question they asked me after discussing the case, they said, you know, don't you think that the Occupy movement served its purpose? Don't you think that, uh, and that they didn't need to continue this campaign? That, you know, they camped for a while, they got public attention, and enough was enough. And that, I think, was the sentiment among the elite, the judges, the political elite, the newspaper reporters in Pittsburgh. When he asked me that question, um, I said, well, their point is they want to end this inequality. Has it been ended, number one? And number two, um, you don't say that when the corporations give a million dollars to influence an election. You don't say, well, you can only give a million dollars, and now you've served the purpose, and that's, and that's it. You can't give any more money. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is the corporation, they have a right to continue doing it. And this whole notion that they serve their purpose by a symbolic occupation and that enough is enough, I think misunderstands the whole point of this, which is to, <coughs> to disrupt the status quo, to, for, to force these issues into the public debate, and not just to do it for a day or two or for a week. You know, one last thing on this. I had a, um, I have a good friend who was a newspaper reporter from San Diego, the Free Union, or you know what it's called. Um, he once told me, you know, you, could write, you have freedom of speech in this country. You can write an op-ed, say whatever you want, and the paper will publish it sometimes. Even though San Diego paper is a reactionary paper, they'll publish some liberal op-eds, or they'll write a liberal co uh, uh, newspaper, and sometimes they'll let it go by. Usually they edit it. They take out anything that's, that they don't want. But sometimes something good gets through. He says, but then you have to counterbalance that with a steady drumbeat, day after day, of whatever the issue of the day is, that welfare people are cheating the system, or that crime is on the rise and has to be stopped, or that terrorism has to be stopped. And you get that not from one op-ed, but on the news, on the papers. So the, the, the public attention is totally skewed, even though an individual has the right of freedom of speech. Um, and I guess a friend of mine and I wrote an article in the Post Pittsburgh paper, and our point was that the real occupation that's constitutionally problematic is not this occupation of this little square. And by the way, Zuccotti Park in New York has the same issue, because Zuccotti Park is a privately owned park but I believe it's a public forum, even though it's a private little park. But it's not the occupation of a Ducati Park or Mellon Park in Pittsburgh, but it's the occupation, the ongoing occupation of the public debate by the major corporations, the major banks, the moneyed interests. And that's the occupation that's really threatening American democracy, and not the people camping out in downtown Pittsburgh on the 20 square. So on that, I'll end and um, open up the discussion. How did the judge address the issue of 
public funds that Mellon used in building the park, or was that not addressed at all? Well, one of the things that I found troubling about this opinion was, number one, anything that didn't square, she ignored. Um, and the, um, so she ignored the city zoning administrator's testimony. She ignored the Pennsylvania city. And what I had expected was what judges usually do, which, would, which is to distinguish, you know, come up with some however weak distinction. She could have done that. Uh, I think the, the distinctions were, were difficult, so she decided just to ignore the opposite position. The public funds, I think what she said is the fact that they built this with public funds doesn't necessarily make it a public forum. Yeah. Just to state the government's, you know, I presume what would be the government's opinion in most of these other cases that would be uh, one reason for closing down the uh, permanent occupations would be health and safety issues and so on. Uh, could you address that? How, how would you, how would you yeah. answer that? Let me address two government arguments. One is that the health and safety issues. I think if you <coughs> did a honest trial on the health and safety issues, you find that in most of the occupations, they were minimal, non-existent. I, the one that I know is Pittsburgh. There were no health and safety issues in Pittsburgh. There were, or very minimal. There were, as I say, no, in three months, there were no significant illnesses in the Pittsburgh occupation. There were no significant injuries in the Pittsburgh occupation. There was always the potential of drug use, but there was a very, we had a, Four tour Iraqi, you know, uh, U.S. war veteran <coughs> who testified, who was the head of their night patrol, uh, people's night patrol, which, which ensured that people weren't using drugs, weren't bringing guns or anything violent. So I, I don't think there were there were no more serious health and safety issues than a major demonstration, which has to be allowed. Um, now, you could say, well, camping always raises health and safety issues. But I think the government has to show, or at least I would argue, that the government has to show that there's some significant health and safety. And if they could show it, I think they could close it down. I think then they'd be right. And so I think the question is, can they, could they show? I don't know what the situation is in Phoenix. I know in Pittsburgh, there were no serious health and safety. I don't know if you have a. No. That was that would be my answer. That they have to actually prove that. The second argument they have is that if you use this place for camping, nobody else can use it. So you're foreclosing the public debate in a way, uh, which I think is a more problem. You know that troubles me more in a way. Uh, I think there are two answers to that. At least in the Pittsburgh example, they weren't. The sidewalks were still used. People could have counter demonstrations, they didn't use the whole park, they were perfectly willing to share it if somebody else wanted. So I don't think there was really the foreclosure of other people. And secondly, I'd say that almost all of the, uh, as I say, most of the media, the um, corporate money is going the other way. This would be one little park which would be used to try to present an alternative, um, an alternative. and I think that in that context it would be justified. Uh, following up on your last statement you just made, uh, back 40 years ago when the Lewis Powell memorandum was given to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce showing ways that the 1% could uh, change the course of what was going on with all the civil rights and all the, uh, everything that looked like would would help tear down capitalism or whatever. Um, he had suggested that, one of the things he suggested was to, I guess, consolidate the media, have, have the corporations own the medias, rather than having hundreds of independent newspapers and radios and televisions, you just have what we have today, where we just have a few dozen own almost all of it. And so your point of having the Occupy movement be an alternative, isn't that the First Amendment argument that if you have freedom of press or freedom of speech, how can you have freedom of press or freedom of speech if if most of the media is owned by the by one side and giving one viewpoint? 
And this Occupy movement is a way of guaranteeing uh, freedom of press and freedom of speech. I mean, it, it, have, has that been argued at all? Yeah, I think so. I, and, and I, you know, you raise a very important question. And it, the Supreme Court has, has spoken in different ways on it. But in the 1960s, um, the government accepted your argument and said we have to regulate the, the uh, TV stations. We have to require that they show um, public broadcasting, you know, that they show. Um, and that was challenged by the news media. And it was in that context in Red Lion Broadcasting Company versus the United States, I believe, that Justice Brennan wrote, the government can regulate the press for the purpose of ensuring broad access to it, you know, ensuring that different opinions get heard. Um, that uh, doctrine has come under vigorous attack and is, if not reversed, it's virtually reversed. Um, I litigated a case, my first case, when I, after I graduated from law school. Um, I worked for a firm, Rabinowitz, Boudin, and Standard, and Lawrence Boudin was a sort of famous guild and civil libertarian lawyer. And we had taken this case of 40 independent documentary makers who had won all sorts of awards and Academy Awards, best documentary, and couldn't have any of their documentaries shown on any major network, which is still true today. Um, because the networks had a flat rule banning uh, independent documentary. They said, if we're going to show a documentary, we're going to make it in-house. And that was at the time when they were under uh, a public broadcasting rule that they had to show some documentaries. Now they just don't have to show any. So you don't see any documentaries hardly at all on the major networks. But at that time, they did. And so we brought this case saying it violated the First Amendment, and it was an antitrust violation. The Supreme Court held in another case that the networks weren't covered by the First Amendment so that they could do whatever they wanted. And then we brought, and um, I knew I was going to lose, uh, yeah. even though I thought I had a great claim because I got caught with holding my little briefcase. I had been one year out of law school, and I had a couple of my clients with me, and three lawyers from each of the major, from each major, from the major <laughs> firms in uh, New York, Wall Street firms representing ABC, NBC, mm -hmm. and CBS got to court. Um, so I figured the odds were stacked. <laughs> and sure enough, the court ruled against us. But, um, but that problem encapsulated in that case, um, I think, is at the heart of a problem in constitutional law, which is that the, that the court has allowed moneyed interest to squeeze out independent um, view, voices. Now, you could say that today this is not a problem anymore because of social media, because of Facebook, you know, that. And that was the argument even then, that cable, that, you know, in the 1960s, the free networks had a monopoly, 95%, 99% of all. Today, that's obviously not the case. So you could argue that the rise of social media, the rise of alternative media outlets, undermines your argument. Um, and I'd be interested in what you think. All right, well, going back to the Mellon Bank, you're leaving yeah. me hanging here. So did the Occupy movement, like, just leave, or do they continue to Occupy and find some other space? And why can't they just find another space? Yeah, I mean, they, I'm they, just playing devil's advocate, but. Right. They, they, well, first of all, the finding another space is not so easy, because Me Mellon did not have any regulation. But the city has regulations prohibiting camps. And if they tried to regulate the camp on a city park, they would get kicked out. Then the city would say, we're not going to Can't they just do a day occupy, or is that not like? Well, they could do a day occupy, but they, they're, this, all, this only happened last week. I mean, you know, two no, weeks ago. It didn't happen months ago. Okay. So the occupy folks are, are formulating their plans as we speak. I and I don't know what they're going to do. They could occupy what they did in New York and in other places is they joined the foreclosure, anti-foreclosure movement. And occupied buildings. That, so that's one option. In Pittsburgh, another option would be to um, to do what they're doing in Zuccotti Park, which they could probably do in April, which is to have a 
you know, a vigil without camping, but a continual vigil without mm -hmm. camping. That's another option. Mm -hmm. Third is to find an alternative space. Mm -hmm. um, fourth is to try to branch out and just do continuous events without, but there are many different alternatives which they're not discussing. You've said that um, two things that are important, free speech, in your opinion, are sort of um, duration of speech, where you mm -hmm. continually bang the drum, right. and then also the placement, you know, in this case, they were in a public place, which was prominent and visible. And um, I'm looking at an article about uh, when people were arrested at uh, State Charles <laughs> Plaza in downtown Phoenix, and um, the uh, sergeant who was arresting people said, um, you don't need a couch to practice your First Amendment. Long story short, it's just gotten out of hand. So his argument was that you don't need a place in order to, a specific place in order to practice free speech, and also that it's gone out of hand, it's excessive, it's served its purpose. And I was wondering what you thought about um, maybe it, in the specific case of Occupy Phoenix or other ones, um, how they're gonna have to move forward in order to continue being successful in terms of beating their drum. Like what form that'll have to take if they've been kicked out of these public places. Yeah, I, I think the key to, and, and I wrote a, long, a longish article which might be good sleeping material. Um, but um, I think the key to Occupy right now is sustainability. We've got to figure out some way to sustain this movement and not have it be a sporadic thing. Now, how to do that tactically, I think is dependent on cities, you know, different cities. I think, for example, Boston is also planning a, a spring awakening, you know, sort of be like the bears and hibernate for the winter and then come back in the spring. Um, but the, the trouble <coughs> with these types of movements historically has been the sustainability issue. And how do you sustain organizational forms that raise these issues in a public way but over the long haul? Um, and I don't, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I'm trying to work on a book on that. but. Um, you know, and this is not the first case of occupations go back, I mean, probably before this, but back to the levelers and diggers in England who tried <coughs> to occupy public lands that were being enclosed for private property. And they lost. You know, they were eventually driven off. Um, uh, so, you know, how to do this is, I think, the task. And I wish I had better answers. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. Uh, you asked me, I know it's unfair, but I'm a law professor, what can you do? I don't know. My thought is, the answer is, you need to have the people that are willing to sacrifice, willing to give up their time to continue the movement. When you have the people there that are willing to do the lead work, do the organizing work, then it will happen. But it's a matter of those people willing. There are people out there that want to participate, but they're not necessarily, majority of them are not participating. So what does it take to get those people to want to do it? One of the difficulties we've had though in Pittsburgh is how to grow the movement. You know, the idea of the movement is for the 99%. And for the last two months, quite frankly, it's been a pretty insular movement. You know, people are camping and they're supporters. Um, which, and I think it's still been great, but the question is how to really get out to the neighborhoods, how to get the people, how to get to the 99% and engage them. And the Occupy movement, I don't think, in Pittsburgh anyway, has been that successful in doing it. The, uh, if you look at just the way that Occupy movements spread up across the country, and it uh, inevitably had to develop some sort of uh, cooperation or relationship with the homeless people around based on their idea of occupying public space, and, and it kind of, brings tensions, it seems in my experience, within those homeless communities because then you have new people trying to assert the same rights that, you, that people were previously trying to assert. And that really kind of uh, has been highlighted here in the, this city with uh, the enforcement of the uh, anti-camping ordinance, which makes it illegal to even prepare for sleep. And, um, and so when you talked about like the history of occupations going back to the origins of the enclosure movement and developing <coughs> private property, and uh, one thing we've seen in Phoenix is with the Phoenix Camper Homeless Camping Association trying to raise eight million claims of uh, cruel and unusual punishment for punishing people for sleeping, which sleeping should be a human right. And, uh, and then that kind of bringing tension with people saying that 
Occupy people shouldn't, ex shouldn't be enforced, shouldn't have should an exception to the anti-urban camping rule because they're not sleeping out of necessity, but for First Amendment issues, which deserve greater protection. And so I guess, for me, it, this Occupy movement brings into the question, you know, the role of private property in our society, and, and like kind of challenging it, because if they had a space that was collective that they could use, you know, then the, this wouldn't be as much of an issue, but the, the property interests are fearful of that, and it, if you look back at uh, other other movements, you know, where collective efforts have made to occupy, they, it provides that sustainability to the movement in the sense of a public space where people can come and have other needs met too, with the food and shelter as well, and, and all the other things that solidarity brings. So, is, do you think that there's any room for the development of, you know, an argument that you know people have fundamental rights to space and, uh, and the right to the, the right to assemble? to meet more than expressive needs, but to meet genuine like core needs to survive. Right. Yeah, I, I still think that the basic argument is the First Amendment argument. That, that this, I don't think the Occupy movement has done this primarily as a meeting their own human needs. I think it was <coughs> doing it for the purpose of um, spreading a message, a very clear message. And the question is, why should camping or occupying be prohibited? Um, and I guess it goes back to this gentleman's question. If there was a compelling government reason to prohibit it, um, then I think the First Amendment would have to give way. But I don't see that there's a compelling government reason. In fact, I think there's a compelling government reason to protect it because of the, um, the way it promotes public debate, public discourse. And I think underlying your, your point is that private property has occupied the public space. And this is an attempt to unoccupy that, you know, to, to <coughs> get rid of or make some inroads into that occupation, the occupation by private property and by big corporations in the public space. Um, and that, I think, ought to be protected by the First Amendment. I, I don't think that the Eighth Amendment or the human needs argument is going to go very far. I think in terms of the homeless, you know, that might be a different, a different argument. <coughs> they have certain rights based on Eighth Amendment and human needs. That I would agree with. But I think the occupants, like the unemployed army, the homeless army in the 19, late 1920s, it, it was the same thing. It, it was an attempt to bring a political message to the country. We think about the argument as some of the guild lawyers are making that the freedom of assembly is a neglected freedom under the First Amendment and that you have the right of assembly to debate for the public good. And that's why you need to <coughs> occupy because you need the space to debate for the public good and that that's been an ignored argument in, this, uh, in these legal proceedings. Yeah, I think that's a great argument. So, um, you know, the problem with that argument is they'll say, look, there are plenty of other public, there's plenty of areas. you can have public space, you could use the public park, you could use the public sidewalks, just not the camp. You know, so that's the, the part of the problem that we have in, in terms of the constitutional issue, the Occupy, which is the government's argument is we're not depriving you of a space, we're just depriving you of 24-hour usage of the space. And do you remember that one case, I don't remember which one it was, where the judge said that Occupy has a negative implication because it's as a foreign army <coughs> occupying yeah, That's the Boston case. Was that the Boston case? Boston case said you had actually a right, a First Amendment right to camp, but not a First Amendment right to occupy. <laughs> um, that was the interesting thing about the Boston case, that they made that, the judge made that distinction, and it was based on this argument that occupation sounds like a radical foreign idea. You know? <laughs> Uh, this is really just kind of off the top of my head, but has anyone considered, particularly in the cases where you're dealing with private property, claiming an easement? I mean, it seems to me that after the public's been there for a certain amount of time, they have an easement. No, we, we, we made a forceful argument to that effect. We, we argued that they had given us a conditional privilege or you know, something like that. Because they had, you know, they let us, in fact, in Pittsburgh, it was more outrageous. After two weeks of the occupation, they gave the occupiers a, a list of conditions. And they said, if you, these are the conditions that you have to follow for the duration of the occupation. 
and so they said, well, we follow them. Isn't that like a conditional license? And the law in Pittsburgh, and this, I didn't do that part of the brief, so I'm a little hazy on it. Uh, and I'm hazy about property law generally. Uh, but the law, I think, is that you have to, ex to, to, a conditional license can always be negated unless you've taken, unless you've relied on it by spending money. So we tried to show that we spent a lot of money winterizing this camp. So we lost a chance. Um, and uh, the court didn't accept that. I, I, I wasn't very hopeful about that argument. Went. But we had, in, in Pittsburgh, we had a great fact pattern because they had let us use it and they had given us a list of conditions. I do know that in, in, some, in Rochester, the city, worked, the city worked out a deal with the occupied movement and they continued the camp. I don't know if they actually have it in Canada. I haven't been to Rochester and checked it out, but there was an agreement signed, I think, pursuant to some court case um, where they allowed them to stay. But that was totally voluntary. Could you talk about the other court cases you've been involved in? What's been the most exciting use of laws as a form for making social change that you've experienced over the last number of years? Uh, you want me to go a little far afield from the occupied? Yeah, it, when you're done with the question, um, I, I'd like to hear that. If you want. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other questions on the occupied? <laughs> and then I'm going to get to okay. that because that, that's where my heart lies, that question. Since the judge's argument seemed to be so weak, at least in your description, uh, did you consider appealing or getting a stay? Or? Yeah, this again shows how the legal system is skewed. First of all, Bell and Bank had, you know, they had five lawyers who paid a lot of money. To, like every time we turned around, there was some new court paper being filed. Um, for us to appeal, we would have had to make an emergency appeal. Even though it was weak, the standard on a preliminary injunction is unless the um, district, the lower court was irrational, was acting totally arbitrarily. And I don't think it was totally arbitrary. I think that she had a weak argument, but it would have been a firm on appeal uh, in all likelihood because of the, the standard on appeal. At some point, it would have it took us a huge amount of energy just to fight the case on the lower court. It would have taken a huge amount of energy, and we could not probably have done it for the occupiers have been evicted. So it would have been a period of victory anyway. So for all those reasons, we decided not to appeal. One more question. On You're sort of talking about two tracks, it seems, because in the Pittsburgh case, it's a, against a private business. But most of your talk was about how the government's yeah, interest. Yeah. And this is not government, really. I mean, supposedly we have an impartial judge to decide the distinction between this group and a, and a private business. Where in other places it is, there has been governments who have been su suing. And then when you said that the Pittsburghs are thinking about public parks, but they think they won't be able to do that because of the no camping rule, that's a completely different aspect. So it might be something else that they would want to challenge. Right. There were, that's true. There, there were two aspects of this. I think they're related. One is the opening up of private spaces to the public use. But private spaces which have already been used for the public, number one, which have been designated for public use, and which were funded by the public. So that was our argument in Pittsburgh. I think the broader argument, and in Pittsburgh we, had a thought, we thought we had a chance of winning because they had no regulations, like Columbia, South, you know, the South Carolina. But the broader argument is, can you use this tactic as a First Amendment tactic, or are you going to be precluded? And the cases are unanimous that the government can preclude you, and that even if Mellon had been found to be operating a public forum, they could have come back, and it might have taken them some time. But they could have, we knew we were going to lose at the end of the day, you know, that camping could be prohibited. And I guess this gets to my to the next point, which is um, I think this is an issue that we have to fight it. But the battle lines have to be the public space is being precluded from most people. The 99% are precluded from the public debate because 
they don't have the money, they don't have the spaces, they don't have the ability, and they could, sure, they could pick it, they could have demonstrations, but these are drops in the bucket compared to the overall picture. And now we have to figure out ways to change that overall picture. This occupation was one way, but we know that the government is going to try to prevent that. Um, and so I think it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing battle, uh, which is an uphill fight. Certainly an uphill fight in the courts, um, and it's pro probably an uphill fight politically too, because of the sustainability issue. I was going to ask if you thought that um, any sort of argument could be made that effectiveness of speech could be used to defend the speech, because you said that in these cases, um, you said that the duration wasn't um, excessive because it hadn't been effective. That is to say that the protesters' demands hadn't been met <coughs> in any way, um, or that their vision hadn't been um, you know, really integrated into the public debate enough. And so do you think any argument could be made that unless speech is considered effective, it isn't, um, couldn't be ever considered excessive? Yeah, that, you mean if it hasn't reached its goal? Yeah. The trouble with that is that clearly violent, you know, I mean, there clearly is some speech which can be prohibited, even if it's not effective. You know, like obscene or, you know, I mean, speech that's inciting to riot. Mm -hmm. um, now, but you raise an interesting point. I, I said that. But, you know, the, the clear and present danger doctrine, the basic First Amendment doctrine, says that you're allowed to even incite to riot if you have no, if you have no ability carry that out. Um, but that's, I guess, the opposite of what you're saying. Namely that, um, well, it's not, no. That's saying that if your speech has no chance of being effective, even if it's prohibited speech, even if it can be prohibited, it's got to be allowed. Under the theory that you should allow a lot of speech until it causes an immediate danger. Um, <coughs> The trouble with the Occupy problem, by the way, is that this isn't considered speech, per se. It's a combination of speech and conduct. And that is subject to a lesser standard <coughs> under the First Amendment than pure speech. So if the Occupy folks want to get to the street corner and say, 99% have been screwed, the 1% are controlling everything, they have an absolute right to do that. But once they start handing out leaflets, or demonstrating, or occupying, then it's in a mixture of speech and conduct, and the government has more power to regulate it. Um, but I think your, the broad point that I made and that you're following up on is that the court has in a number, you know, the, the argument here is, well, you have alternative ways of doing this. You don't have to camp. You can hand out leaflets. You can go to the street corner, pick it, you know. There's a, but that didn't work. That didn't protect, uh, that didn't uh, allow the government to prohibit flag burning. The government said, look, if these guys want to say the U.S. government is uh, genocidal or it's fascist, they can do that. They just don't can't burn the flag to make that point. And the court said, you've got to allow them to use whatever tactic they want. Um, but the difference in that case is that the government's only interest was in protecting the flag as an ideological symbol. Here the government says we want to protect the grass or protect the beauty of the park. We're not interested in attacking the ideology of Occupy. We just don't like camping. Whereas flag burning, the only problem with it was that you were burning the symbol of the flag. Um, let me get to the left to that to the question here, which is, uh, can I talk about um, the cases I've done on behalf of the Center for Constitutional Rights, which have been my most exciting cases? And that's hard to do because they're all the same. <laughs> no, but, um, for many years, I litigated war powers and foreign policy cases. I, I guess one of my claims to fame, I guess, is that I litigated against every president. <laughs> um, and I represented Democratic members of Congress, suing so Bush around the first uh, uh, Iraq war and I represented mainly Republicans <coughs> in Congress, uh, suing Clinton under the, for the Kosovo. <coughs> because in both cases, the president was acting in violation of the Constitution, which says only Congress can authorize warfare, and not, not the president. Um, I would say that I thought of 
calling up the Guinness Book of Records because I had probably the longest losing streak in the United States at the time. All these cases lost. They were, you know, sometimes we won, we won major uh, symbolic victories, like in the Persian Gulf case, where the where the judge said President Bush can't go to war without congressional approval and said, but then the issue's not right, right? Like, come back. I sort of felt like the new, I was in The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard was saying, come back with the broomstick. So come back the president was about to go, right, like immediately about to go to war. And I knew if I had done that, uh, he would now he would then say, it's moot, you know, because you, know, you didn't get the court on time. Um, but ideologically, Congressman Dellums, who I was doing this on behalf of, went on Nightline and said, we won in court. We won because the court said the president couldn't go to war. And the Attorney General Thornburg, traveling to Paris, said, we won because the court said I'm not going to issue an injunction. And both were, both were right. Um, but uh, I, my, my luck then turned dramatically. And I guess in the, in the last decade, I've been involved in two cases, which I'll end with. Um, both were um, victories, even or victories of sorts, uh, even though they appeared to be total losers in the beginning. Uh, the first was I was involved with the Guantanamo cases, particularly the Brazil case, which was litigated in 2004 in the Supreme Court. <coughs> and the center brought this case as yet another one of these little bell kind of cases. I didn't, I wasn't the lawyer on it, uh, particularly because I was working on another case, which I'll tell you about. But it, it looked like sure loser. In fact, no other civil liberties organization would take the case because it looked like a loser because we had a precedent, a Supreme Court precedent, dead set against <coughs> us, uh, written in the 1950s about German prisoners of war. And this was whether the people in Guantanamo had any rights at all, had a right to habeas corpus. Um, and we lost to the district court. We lost unanimously in the Court of Appeals, and nobody gave us a chance. But it goes to this point, this drumbeat of agitation. We had kept up a constant <coughs> drumbeat, which was escalating by 2004, that this was unacceptable to keep these people in Guantanamo with no legal remedy whatsoever. And by 2004, that drumbeat had, had crescendo to a whole orchestra, you know, with the whole drum line. Uh, and I think it reached the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court did cert, and as you probably know, the Supreme Court reversed the lower courts and held twice now that the folks in Guantanamo do have a right to habeas corpus. Unfortunately, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which the, 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 court of the Supreme Court has reversed twice, and which hates the Supreme Court's opinions on these Guantanamo cases, have done, has done everything in its power to render the right of habeas meaningless. So it's rendered very difficult. So it's a, it was a tremendous victory, which may not have, <coughs> which had some, a, a major effect, but has not, uh, the courts have not ordered the release of any prisoners, actually. Um, the second case was a case that I brought, again on behalf of the center, a challenging prolonged solitary confinement in Ohio without any due process, where they were just, it's the same case as Guantanamo in a way. It's just a domestic case. They throw, they throw people in. There are 80,000 prisoners in the United States who are in solitary confinement at any one moment. And many of them have been in solitary confinement for years. In California, there are 75 prisoners who have been held in solitary confinement in windowless small cells for over 20 years. Um, and in Ohio, we challenge this. I couldn't get any self-respecting prison litigator to take this case, because it was seen as a loser. And my friends, the Stoughton and Alice Lynn, who lived in Ohio and wanted to challenge this, they couldn't find anybody. So they said, hey, this fellow will bell, Jules will call. <laughs> this is a specialty, losing cases. <laughs> um, well, that case we got, after a week-long trial, the judge issued, said that, can't keep, they had 500 
do it, you have to give them due process. <coughs> Within a year, there are only 50 left in the <coughs> It's a supermax prison. And it was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And we won a draw in the Supreme Court. I consider a major victory on prison issues. Um, the, prison, the Supreme Court held that there was a liberty interest and therefore a right to due process. You couldn't put these people in solitary without due process. But that the process was minimal. That they didn't have to give them an attorney or a right to evidence or cross-examination. But they had to give them a right to say, here's why you're being charged. And many of these people had no idea why they were even being put in this And give, give them an opportunity to, to respond. And then, of course, they could appeal to court if they could get a lawyer, which they, of course, can't generally. But in this case, they had us. Um, so I'd say that's a five minute, 10 minute rendition of some of the cases I've done on behalf of the Center for Constitutional Rights, which does a lot of these types of cases. And hopefully, we'll continue doing them for many more years. So thank you. Thank you for coming.